Uh, good morning again. Thank you very much for showing up here and also online. We have a you know, good group of individuals online, over 40 again. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of updates today, so it's really your time to ask questions and put everybody on, on spot to answer. Our uh, supervisor of supervisors is here too, so she should be able to answer all the questions. <laughs> uh, let's start with um, on the IRB issues. Cindy, do you want to? Cindy Gates, do you want to go first? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, I just want to tell everyone it's been a disappointing week. The last week, we've had two studies that were a just-in-time submission to the IRB that we didn't have time to complete the review, and. The reason I'm talking today is to let you know that it takes, it can take several weeks to do an IRB review. And if you turn your submission in the day you need it, if you wait till just in time, there's a chance that we won't get it done. We try really, really hard. If it has to go to a full committee though, we might have to schedule a special meeting. And this means that peers of the investigator, physicians and other faculty and stuff have to get together, come to a meeting after they've read everything and compared it to the laws and stuff, and then they have to discuss it and vote. That can take several weeks. So the take home message from my discussion today is don't wait till just in time to send your submission to the IRB. We don't mind reviewing it, getting it over, and then you not get the grant. You might get the grant at a later time or you might get other funding to do it. It's, it we don't consider it a waste of time. So when you submit your grant proposal, what do you think you should start doing? If, you, if it's human subject research, start writing your protocol and getting your submission ready for the IRB. You can wait maybe a month or so, but it's best just to get it all done. And when just in time comes, you can send your IRB approval right away. And even if it's exempt or not human subject research, a lot of the funding agencies and departments want an IRB determination. And again, that takes a little bit of time. So don't wait till the last day of just in time, please do it way ahead if possible. Um, and I don't know what's on camera, so I'll come up here. Uh, one suggestion relative to timing. So we don't want people wasting their time developing protocols for a project that won't move forward. But your faculty earlier on in the process know what their scores are from the peer review process. This is prior to just in time and all of that. So on the programmatic side, you're going to get your scores and you have a general sense of whether you got a fundable score or not, right? That's the time you need to start submitting your IRB protocols because you're going to have a time delay of two to three weeks, right? Before the grant side of the house, you know, your contract and grant officers start asking for just in time information. So that's your buffer time, and that's, that should be sufficient to get you in the queue at the IRB in a timely enough manner to then, um, you know, so you're not wasting time, but you're not unable to meet the NIH just-in-time deadlines. And so that's just a, a recommendation that once your PI knows that score, if it looks like it's fundable, start the process. Thanks, Cindy. So don't wait till just in time. <laughs> oh, that's done. I suppose that's in response to um, what we are hearing from uh, researchers that uh, uh, I send a proposal out and I'm hoping to get the award, but there is no guarantee. That's why they wait you know, to the last minute. But as Cindy said, in, in especially like in NIH uh, situation, um, and in some other cases, actually, this is the case. Way before the award is issued, uh, issues, they know what the chances are. They know that they have a high chance of getting it. But even if they don't get that wrong, they know that they are going to apply again, most probably. So as Cindy Gates said, it makes sense that you know, sometime in that period to uh, turning the IRB review package. 
Any questions on that? Before Cindy Gates, especially, is running away right now to her IRB meeting in Sacramento. Any questions online? I don't see anything online either. Okay. Thank you very much, Cindy. And Cindy. Cindy's, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sherry. Uh, do you want to talk about our new database, Caius, and all of the related things? It, you know, lots of exciting things are happening. The database is working really well, and Sherry wants to give us an update on where we are. Good morning. Ooh, that's kind of loud. It is a hot one. I regularly have a loud voice anyway, so this could be a challenge for me. Uh, good morning, I'm Sherry Pulis. I'm the ERA Project and Business Analyst for the Office of Research, for those of you who don't know me. And I just wanted to give you an update on how we are doing on Caius. So currently right now, things are going fairly well with the pilot departments. We actually have nine that have confirmed. And I do believe, Cassie, we have two that are actively using the system, is that correct? Three. Three, okay. Yeah, we have three that are actively using the system and submitting proposals, which is very exciting. We also have the SPO office who is actively using the system as well. And right now we're working with those pilot departments to address any issues or any things that come up within the system that might need tweaking or things that we need to assist them with. Also, I want to remind you, if you have any login issues, um, either with Cayuse SP or Cayuse 424, to send an email to SPO ERA help at ucdavis.edu and then we triage those to see who they need to go to to help with those different various issues for logging in. And also the training. The trainings have been going well. We've trained so far about 150 individuals and we have held four sessions and there are two more left. So there is one this Friday here at the Office of Research beginning at one o'clock and they're every hour until four, until four. So one, two, yeah, so one to two, two to three, and then three to four. You do not need to RSVP. You can just come and show up. And with those trainings, we are helping the department set up their role manager and also explaining the other various roles that you can have within your department, as well as showing you how to view awards and subawards, and then kind of showing you how the system works. So, and then there'll be another additional training next Friday at the Med Center. And those start at 9 a.m. And those are every hour till noon, correct? Okay, so 9 to 10, 10 to 11, and then 11 to 12. And once again, you do not need to RSVP for those sessions. There's been a little confusion. The Caius SP sessions that we're holding on Fridays, you do not need to RSVP for. You can just show up and come in and enjoy the, the training session that Cassie offers. The Caius 424 sessions, the labs that we hold on Thursdays from 9 to 10.30 here at Office of Research, you do need to RSVP for those. And you can send an email to proposals at ucdavis.edu because what happens is we, we hold that spot. Oh, changed you changed it to spell? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I've been corrected. We are now sending emails <laughs> for that to spell training and Cassie is helping facilitate those now. I used to do that, but now that Cassie is on board, she's going to take over that responsibility for myself. Uh, so that way we can see if you need a laptop and or if no one attends that session, then just want to let you know no one will be in the room. So you have to RSVP for the Cayuse 424 trainings and we don't want you to think we're ignoring you, that we're not showing up, but if we don't have any responses, then we'll release the analysts to go ahead and do other work that they need to do. We are also working on the rollout schedule on how we're rolling out by colleges. We're still vetting that. And as soon as we have a final schedule, we will definitely let those colleges know when those dates are coming up. And the reporting team, they have been working very hard on their reporting. And they are in the final testing of the phase one of the reports that they need for campus and for leadership and for various departments. And then they will start working on setting up, we kind of have a phase 1.5. And if you have any questions for the project related aspect of the Cayuse implementation, you can email myself and it's just kspulis at ucdavis.edu. Did I miss anything, Cindy, that you wanted to add? It's more clarity. Um, <coughs> so 
you didn't miss anything. <laughs> um, but from a clarification perspective, we have received a lot of questions about um, when we say we're piloting schools, it's only on the proposal part of the system. The award part of the system is already live for everyone, okay? So that's why we have these two different kind of sets of training. The training we're doing on Fridays, which is the one hour that you don't have to sign up for, that's so you can come and see how to pull your awards information and your sub-award information out of the system and how you get individuals in your departments and colleges set up with roles and responsibilities in the system. So that's what that's about because the award part of the system is live for everyone. All right, no pilots, live for everyone. Okay, it's the proposal submission system that is in pilot, and we are moving that college by college during the fall. So we've, we've provided an initial list to the assistant deans in the college that suggest a certain timeline for each college, and it is based primarily on your peaks and valleys of when your faculty have historically submitted proposals. We're trying to avoid heavy deadline timelines for when we roll your college in. So I've provided that information and that report to the assistant deans, and we are going to be waiting for their feedback on whether they're okay with that time frame for your college after reaching out to whoever they need to reach out to in your college. And so as soon as that is finalized, then we will more robustly let you know when your college will be going live with the proposal submission mechanism of Cayuse SP. So I hope that kind of clarifies <laughs> what the pilots are versus the already live portions of the system. Uh, regarding that, that distinction is extremely important and it goes to, to the uh, fact that you know that in the old system we had to the end of last uh, June, when we had an award, you would get an email saying that there is an award and click here, you would get your award and so on and so forth. You won't get it anymore. And that's why, you know, she's explained that you have to come through you know, those trainings to know how to pull it from the system yourself when, you know, whenever you want to take them out. And one of the nice things is in the system, once you're in, instead of having to call, I mean, you can still call your analyst to say hello and all of that, but, but um, you can actually see the status of your own subcontracts and your awards in the system. So you don't, I mean, you have visibility now into what's going on with your awards and subawards. So that's a big benefit of this, of accessing things that way. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of clarify that we've got people- You want to give her the microphone? Or, or just to, that we've got, the proposals are being entered into the by other people. Who right. So they're in there right now. I don't know. So from a sponsored programs perspective, um, July 1, we started doing all the data entry into the new system, not our old legacy system. So uh, what's happening between now and when your college goes live on proposals, sponsored programs analysts are doing all of that data entry that normally would occur in the departments right, uh, for those colleges who have not gone live yet. So that is a workload on them to do that data entry uh, until your college goes live. So we had two questions online that I think everyone might benefit from. One was, will only new awards show or will old awards show? And the answer is that only award transactions from July 1st and later will show an SP. Okay, new awards Grace. in which, <laughs> this is, okay, award side, this is a question I've been getting. New awards that we receive, SPO receives after July 1st will be in Cayuse, not awards executed after July 1st. So if SPO has received the award in June and executed in July, it will still be in our old system. Only awards received by SPO July 1st or later will be in the new system. And there will be a test on all of these things we just talked about. <laughs> yeah, after, so. yeah, uh, for us, right, so that we know. Yeah, just um, <laughs> so the other question was, are we going to 
schedule any more training sessions. And we do not intend to schedule any more training sessions for the role manager and department admins. So we've had four, and we're going to have one more this Friday. Like Sherry mentioned in Davis, starting at one, there'll be actually four, and then one, uh, three more next Friday, the 20 or the August 4th, I think it is in Sacramento at 9, 10 and 11 at the med center and in the education building. And we do not intend to schedule any more. We will have training sessions for inputting proposals at a later date, whenever we start rolling it out college by college. All right. Any other questions, any comments? Is that it for online, Cassie? We have one more. Um. <laughs> Can you clarify what the difference is between active projects and proposals in my units? So projects are the overarching folder um, that house the proposals. So active projects are and awards and sub awards. And so active projects are this overarching folder. Your proposals, we, when we get a proposal in, we assign it to a project and so they work together but they're two different things and then going from there when you get funded an award is built off of a proposal so you can view all of that at the project level you can also view all of your sub awards they're called subcontracts and sp at the project level okay. thank you all right thank you very much okay any more questions on any of that so if someone can't attend the next two trainings What's their options in order to... They should email this for training. Okay, the question was if uh, someone would want to come through tra uh, training but can't uh, come in the next two days that we have the training, what should they do? And Cassie said... Email SPO training at ucdavis.edu and the training materials are also online at the Spark training website. Thank you. Okay, going one forward. <laughs> one more question. That's good. Very good. Yeah, that's great. It's great. Please send the questions in. Yeah, thank you. So can you please explain how accounting will receive notification that an award is ready for funding? And they are getting, accounting is getting a nightly, I think. Is it nightly? They're getting a feed nightly of all new awards from our system. And? And then more. Process. Yeah, and then they'll start processing them from there. So they're getting notified um, in a similar fashion as before. And the nightly, it, it's, uh, you know that we work 24 hours a day. The nightly means 4 a.m. So 4 a.m. day, the report goes up. It takes care of everything from the day before. Okay? Any more questions? And uh, no, we are going to change topics, but meanwhile, if questions come up, please send them in either online or here. We will take you on them. Um, any updates from compliance? Uh, Jessica. Jessica from compliance has updates. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Jessica Trask. I'm an analyst over in research compliance and integrity, and I just have two quick updates, uh, one of which is very important. We have been notified by LMS that their system will, for training will be unavailable between July 28th and August 7th. And this is especially important if you are an NIH funded investigator or you are planning on receiving NIH funding and you will need to complete the uh, conflict of interest briefing for researchers. Uh, often that is necessary before an award can go through. Uh, that you will not be able to do that between July 28th and August 7th. Uh, unfortunately, that's not a system that RCI has any control over. We, we just receive a report from them, but we wanted to give everyone a heads up that if you anticipate that you will need to take that training, please do it before July 28th because you will not be able to do it until after August 7th. And again, this is for people who are anticipating NIH funding. So that means that we have only today and tomorrow. Uh, today, and today and tomorrow, yes. Yeah. So. You have two days, today and tomorrow, to take care of that. Mm -hmm. Unless if you can wait till after August 7th. Exactly. But the system will be, LMS has notified us that the system will be completely down. I guess they're doing some upgrades. So please be aware. And my second announcement is just to 
uh, please continue to use our online disclosure system. Uh, we have ro we rolled that out June 1st. It's been uh, very popular. We get dozens of disclosures every day. Uh, if you have any problems uh, or if you're having difficulty submitting, difficulty finding where you're supposed to be in the system, please uh, don't hesitate to email us. Uh, those can be directed towards or underscore COI at ucdavis.edu. Also on the Research Compliance and Integrity website, we have all of our training materials. We have a very lengthy step-by-step -step guide. We have an investigator quick start guide. We have a quick start guide for administrators. So uh, please continue to use the system. We will be accepting paper copies throughout the summer, but the sooner you get on the system, the better, because it really does give everyone access to your paperwork simultaneously. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. No problem. Questions? Yes, no? Sure. One other compliance training related item. Um, some of you who haven't been around for a, a few years may not know this, but about three years ago, we entered into a compliance agreement with the National Science Foundation and Department of Justice. Um, it was a, a settlement agreement where we agreed that we would provide mandatory training to NSF funded PIs, and it had to re be repeated at a two-year interval in order to satisfy our settlement agreement. I was able to negotiate with the Department of Justice to provide that training via an email to our faculty. Um, all they have to do is read the email and then click on the, you know, click on the link that they read it, okay? Um, <laughs> so just to verify that. So it's, we tried to make it as easy as possible for our NSF PIs. We need to do that repeat training. So it's likely going to be in August that we're going to be sending out emails to all of those NSF funded P with NSF active awards. Um, and so we have to do this last round. This will be the last time we have to do it in order to satisfy the terms of our agreement. Um, so if, uh, you know, and we will hound the PIs until they get it done. Um, so, uh, it took us about eight months last time to get everybody not, done. Not hounding, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it took a long time. That hounding part that she's talking about, uh, towards the end of that period, we had to put awards of certain PIs on hold and not process them because we couldn't. Uh, yeah, the promise until they, NSF. I mean, so, we've really made it as simple as, as we possibly can, yeah. but just let, to let you know, we have to do that last round to finish up with our settlement agreement with NSF OIG. No, no, these emails will go directly to the PIs who have to complete the training. Um, that's yes. how we did it before. Right. So, but. Uh, we can look into that. But we'll look this, into that. Yeah, these emails, again, it's only for NSF. Our general emails usually go to lots of other people. Every time I send something out, I get lots of complaints. Why did you send this to me? I don't, I don't know how to spell NSF event. Uh, so only Anne-Marie needs, needs an email. Okay. So we <laughs> no, but if you have NSF-funded PIs, and it's only PIs, it's not co-PIs, it's not significant um, you know, other folks, it's the PIs that have to do it. So... Uh, we'll try to figure out if right. there's a way to share it with the department somehow. Great. So I'm, well, I'll be queuing that up later in August. Um, so, yes, I knew that. Thank you. Um, there was a question. Is this email in addition to an RTR course? It is. Yes. Oh, okay. Is this mandatory training for NSF-funded PIs separate from an RCR course? Yes. It's, a, it's much shorter, definitely, as you said. It's very user-friendly. It's online. All they have to do is read certain rules and regulations and say, I understood them. And the primary focus of the required training is your post-award financial management. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do, uh, do PIs need to do both? So do PIs need to do both? PIs should want to do both. <laughs> um, 
we have some excellent uh, training programs that I think any PI would benefit from. When you say have to, the conflict of interest training is a have to. That's regulatorily mandated, right, for faculty, for COI. But general RCR education is not mandated by anyone. None of our sponsors mandate it um, for faculty, okay? So it is voluntary, but highly recommended. Uh, the, the RCR is required for NSF-funded grad students, undergrad students, and it is mandated for NIH-funded graduate students and students who are in training programs and also postdocs, right? There is also a USDA training requirement um, NIF for NIFDA funded individuals. Um, and so that is also a requirement for USDA, uh, NIFDA funded faculty um, that we've been working with Penny Herbert in the College of Ag in particular on. So is that good? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let's see, how about proposals? You have updates. Chris, team leader from proposal. Good morning, everyone. Sorry it was late. Um, I had printer problems trying to print deadlines. <laughs> I need to learn to speak into the microphone. Is that better? <laughs> it's just different. OK, so. Again, good morning. good morning, yay! It's the end of July, into August, and now we have deadlines for August. If those of you don't know, we have a huge <laughs> deadline for August 2nd. Again, huge, huge. Anyway, uh, so starting with that, USDA is one of our big ones that we have for August 2nd, as well as NSF. If those of you don't have your proposal in, you're late. Uh, so first thing with NSF, we have various deadlines. And I tried to print out the dates, but it kept messing up. So what I recommend doing is going to the NSF, just Google NSF deadlines. You're gonna get a whole slew of all the programs that are in August that you can submit to. Some of the SBIRs and STTRs are coming up. So I highly recommend for your faculty to take a look at that because there's a lot of interested faculty out there that want to partner with industry. So I really recommend that on the NIH side on August 5th is their SBIR STTR call. So again, get that in as soon as possible. I'd say no later than the end of this week because we need to get acting on that as quickly as possible. And there's a lot that the industry partner needs to do that we cannot do. That is not our role. Our role is to help our faculty members in their preparation of their proposal represented by UC Davis. We cannot assist with the industry side. So I just want to make sure that's really clear. If there's questions, we're here to help and guide, but we cannot assist with their application package. Uh, on that issue, uh, it, it's a very important issue that she just said. Uh, think about SBIR. It's for small business uh, proposal. Everything has to be done in small business, except for the part that they say that you know, they are expecting to give us a SAB award. We would work on the portion of the proposal, which has to do with the SAB award that if they get the award, we would get a sub award. Be very careful. So, you know, there have been situations that uh, the work of the company to put a package of proposal together has been apparently done in the department. You cannot do that. That's time of university. You cannot you know, work for a company at university you know, expense. And if a PR comes to you saying that, well, no, my friend at the company don't know how to do this and all of that, maybe we can give them guidelines how, what to do, where to look for things. We cannot do their work. So be very careful on that. It's just, you know, it's, it's a huge, huge conflict of interest and conflict of commitment issue there. Thank you very much. Uh, in addition, on August 8th is the NIH Individual Fellowships. And then on August 13th is the diversity fellowships. Those are very popular, so be mindful of those. On August 12th is the NIH conference grants. There's a few faculty that I've seen on a pretty regular basis that like to go for those because obviously it's good recognition, it's good partnering with other universities. So um, if you're interested in that, 
With USDA, again, we have a huge deadline coming up on August 2nd, which is the water food production system. On August 9th is the critical agricultural research and extension program. On August 17th is the social implications in emergency technologies. That's another big one. Those also require letters of intent. So if you did not submit your letter of intent in May or in June, you're not able to submit the full proposal. So it's really important that hopefully the faculty were already ahead of the game in submitting their letters of intent directly to uh, USDA on those. Um, then, okay, uh, one housekeeping item, and I'm not sure if it was mentioned because I came in late, so Grace, correct me if I'm incorrect, if this is already said. But one thing that we wanna make sure that people are reminded of is when you submit your application, to our office and that proposal is successfully submitted and you have human subjects on that application, it is imperative that your faculty begin the process of completing their IRB protocol. Yeah, we love that. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> it's good repeating it though. Yeah. Thank you very much for repeating it. <laughs> Submit as soon as possible. There's specialty people that they need on those committees and they need the time to do that. Thanks. Okay, the other thing is a couple of housekeeping things. I don't know if you mentioned this, that we are down staff on the proposal team. We are always down staff, they know that, they have to. <laughs> there, was, there was a stint, there was a stint of time. We were fully, fully, yeah. We had all, all bodies in the seat. Anyway, people move on and they go on to bigger and better things, which is awesome. But please be mindful of that. Our office is working as fast as we can, as diligently as we can, but is a very, busy proposal submission deadline, and most analysts right now have 10 to 12 proposals in their queue for review. So if you can be patient and try to submit as early as possible and as complete as possible, submitting a shell application is gonna make them have to review that application two and three times, which is not a good use of their time. So if there's anything that you can do to help with that, I know you're on the front line with the faculty and you hear it from the faculty and we're here to support you the best way we can please be patient with our office. If we're not responding, feel free to call us. We're gonna to try to get back to you as soon as we can. We try to respond within 24 hours, but right now it seems to be closer to two days. So just- On that mindful. issue of time, and really to be fair to everybody who's sending proposals, let's assume that I send a proposal in, as you said, shell proposal, and the analysts reviewed it, and there are lots of things missing, and I get, I am the PI, from the analyst from here, get an email saying that items one through five are needed, then the analyst who is working on this project is going to go to the next project. So when I, as the PI, send the information in, I would go to the end of the line. I mean, no, just we have to be fair to everybody. So be very you know, careful yes. about making sure that the package comes in together. Last week I was working on a project that the department person um, was under the impression that we had five days. I gave them the you know, the documentation which showed that yes, five days before the deadline, we had received the shell, but in fact, like two and a half, three hours before the deadline, we got everything that we needed. And they were wondering why did it take you know, so many you know, days to you know, send the final email saying that you're missing all of these things. Um, I said, because you gave us two hours. And actually two hours, we shouldn't review anything. And we should really send it out as is. And if there is hopefully an award, then we have to deal with the terms and conditions then. And the consequence might be that the award might not be able to be accepted. So that's why you know, we really have to all work together yeah. to serve our, our researchers. There's a question here, could you answer? Get it, you know, go closer to it. You have to be on the microphone, thank you. Okay. Um, for heavy submission deadlines for the USDA and College of Ag, if you for the um, the August second, if people are going to be sub awardees too, I was I'm just concerned about getting last minute proposals for folks that are going to be subs to other universities. Um, so I just want to make sure that people are aware that that does take time to review those those sub award documents and that. We having those documents, um, the deadline for those documents is not the August 2nd deadline. That's got to be the sponsor, the university that's actually submitting the lead. They, they have a deadline that we need to have their stuff to, and it's usually before, it needs to be before that actual 
August 2nd deadline or, or whatever, because um, otherwise we will likely miss that opportunity. That's a very submit. good point. And actually the deadline you are talking about for the prime award, it might have already passed. Yeah. yeah, so everyone, if you didn't hear that, Brooke made a very good point that if you do have a sub award, if you're participating, your faculty member is participating on another university's proposal to USDA or NIH or anyone, NSF for that matter, DOE, D DOD, it's really important. There's a couple key things to remember for the housekeeping of this. It's important that one, the application budget, the R&R, which is research and related budget, is pulled from that prime application in which that other university is submitting. Otherwise, it really can trip up the application package and create errors unnecessarily in the submission process. We found this to be very true with stuff that we've received um, from others that were subs on our application. So, and sometimes there's not a lot of time to correct that and resubmit in order to make the deadline. So it's really important that working with your faculty that you know that you've received the, the R&R budget pages from that prime application budget. This is most specific to the grants.gov application SF424 submissions. If you're dealing with NSF, it's in Fastlane and they can add our institution in Fastlane. It's a lot different and easier, more streamlined. But not everybody has Cayuse 424 like we do. And uh, sometimes it's really important to make sure that we get that budget completed. As well as if there's asking, they're asking for any other documents from us. It takes time to prepare and sign and submit back to you so we can get this back in a timely fashion to you so they can get it to their prime sponsor as soon as possible for the submission. And I think Cindy said very clearly that if you actually have a proposal as a subaward due on the second, we should probably have it in our office already, five days in advance. It's the same as a full proposal. And so, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about future state since we were talking about Cayuse earlier. Once your college rose out with the proposal submission mechanism and if you want to use SF424 today that we launched September last year, um, there is a subcontract portal that Cayuse offers. Our subcontractors, if we're the lead and we have subcontractors, they do not have to be using Cayuse at their institution in order to use the subcontract submission portal to fill out those forms online and then have it submitted to us. You just need to provide them with the website where they can do that. And then that pulls into our proposal and streamlines the whole thing. So you do not have to have subcontracts that are part of, you know, that have subscribed to Cayuse in order to do that. Yeah, and that website, just so you know, is subawards.com. So it'll get you everything you need. And again, you don't have to have a membership. You don't have to pay for anything. Everything is free and there for you. Um, I do believe you need to know what the call is. I think that is helpful. Um, and if you don't know that, then we can try to help you too. <laughs> but I think that's it, unless there's any questions. So we have a question about, can we get guidance regarding UC Davis eligibility to apply for calls listed under Cal e Secure? Oh, you want to repeat the question and then okay. figure out what's, what Cal you picked up. <laughs> okay. Somebody's looking for guidance on PI eligibility. UC Davis eligibility. Excuse me. UC Davis eligibility on Cal e Procure. I would have to look at it at this point. Um, I don't know. I, I think, is it, the state, is it the state website that they're asking for the submissions? Sounds there? like um, California. Like German or something. It's, Procurement, which means a service right, the service contract so side of it, which is an online website, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, so they asked somebody, and we're told to ask at the forum, but maybe we can just look at it offline. Why don't we do that? Yeah, and then we'll get back to them. Thank you for your question. We'll get back to you. And then we had another question about. Um, so there's a question if we have a list of rollout dates for the colleges that we could provide. And we are working on that right now. Cindy has proposed some dates to the assistant deans and they're checking with people that they need to check with in their colleges and schools. And after we have something approved, we will share it. Thank you. Is there anything else? Anyone else? No burning desires, questions, nothing? Everything's copacetic? You guys are awesome. Thank you.
You want you could go back and review the proposal. Yes, yeah. awesome. um, <laughs> awards, Grace, do you have updates on that you want to share? Grace, the associate director on the award side. Hi, good morning. I just have a few, few updates on the award side. For those of you with NIH SBIR STTR phase two grants or cooperative agreements, your final progress report needs to be in a new format now. It needs to be in the final research performance progress report format instead of the final progress report. So it went from the FPR to the FRPPR format. And there's a new ERA Commons module for you to submit your FRPPR. And that was effective on June 30th this year. So if you submit your uh, final progress report the old way, it will not be accepted. So please look at the website to submit it through the FRPPR process. And also just a to forewarn everyone, the NSF is moving its headquarters to Alexandria, Virginia in October, specifically October 2nd, 2017. They will have a new address and um, you can look that up online, but it will be in Alexandria. Now email addresses and phone numbers for NSF employees and offices will not change. However, um, the physical move will be rolled out over a six week period beginning Thursday, August 24th through um, Sunday, October 1st, and during this time you may experience delayed response times when trying to communicate with your NSF uh, program officers or employees. So just be mindful of that. Their contact information is the same, but during this move they may or may not all be working and checking their email. So <clears throat> get your, uh, get your no-cost extension requests in early because it might take them a while to get back to you during this time between late August and early September. And also on the USDA side, um, on July 17th, the USDA published a request for information called Identifying Regulatory Reform Initiatives. And they're requesting ideas from the public on how to provide better customer service and remove unintended barriers. Okay, so if you have any suggestions for the USDA, they are soliciting your input. And you can submit your comments electronically through uh, www.regulations.gov. Okay, if you have any comments for USDA. No detailed budgets. <laughs> no yes. detailed budgets? Wait until just in time. Full indirect cost. Full indirect cost, right? <laughs> None of this lesser than, you know. Any questions? Okay, so yes, I think hopefully you are all able to access your awards through Cayuse, those that were received after July 1st, and you can see the future state, as Cindy put it, of um, how you can see your. Now, the idea right now is we are still giving you some email prompts, but hopefully your departments will look at your awards on your own, right? You're not going to get the CGT emails. Uh, CGT was our old database. You're not going to get as many emails on the award side in the future. Thank you. No questions there? Any updates from accounting? I don't, uh, Francisco or no, no updates from accounting. They have been extremely busy with the final close, fiscal, fiscal close. So, and I know I, I sent a lot of emails to Francisco. Thank you very much for answering so fast and within half an hour usually. Um, we did pretty well last year as far as, you know, they are researchers getting a lot of money you know, in the form of awards, we you know match basically, very, we are very close to the highest year we had. Uh, it seems like we are clearing uh, 780 million. So you know that the final numbers would be reviewed and certified, approved and so on and so forth by UCOP within the next month and a half. But that's where it seems like we are heading. So it was a very good year, better than last year. And so, you know, our researchers are great as usual. Any questions uh, before or about anything? Anything you heard today, anything you didn't hear, and here you are saying that there's a question. So online they're asking if there will be any indicator on the front page of SP about what has changed since the last time they logged into the system. And the answer is, is no. Um, but however, for if you're looking to see if the status of a proposal has changed, you can go to my proposals, or proposals in my unit, and I can explain that. Um, I explain that at the training sessions, 
um, and see the status. And you can filter by the status, you can search by the status, you can search by the PI and various things, and the same thing in awards. But no, there is not an actual indicator on the front page. Yeah, there's another question that just came in uh, asking when will Cayuse training be offered for faculty? And the answers to that to that is that it will be offered whenever it's rolled out to your college. So during that rollout process, we'll offer training to faculty and anyone else who will be entering proposals into the system. Great. Yeah. So they can also go to the notes section. Mm -hmm. And we are, I know, I think the course is also the sub awards where we're adding notes. Okay. Okay. So, um, Paula just said that you can also, when you open up your subcontract or your award, you can go to the notes tab in that and see any status changes. If it's out to the sponsor, etc. They're adding notes into there where you can see that. Okay. Thank you. Anything else you want to talk about? Going once. Going twice. It's 9.20 and thank you very much for showing up. We'll see you next time. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's like, right, right, right. Well,